So uh, welcome everyone to the second part of the tutorial. Uh, so uh, now, now Naganan will be walking us through uh, some of the applications of uh, the methods uh, that we saw in the first part. Naganan. Okay. So in the NLP domain, so there have been like two popular graph neural nets. So let's briefly discuss them. So let's say this is the input graph given to us. So it has like A, B, C, D, E, F, six nodes. So let's say we want to compute the representation of, let's say we want to compute the representation of the target node, which is vertex A in this example. So the GNN computation graph, a simple two layer computation graph. Uh, so we'll look uh, something like this. So we have the target vertex, which is A. We have all the one hop neighbors of A, B, C, and D. And then we, we have the two hop neighborhood here. So we have the one hop neighbors of the one hop neighbors. So A and C, A, B, E, F, and A, right? So a simple two layer GNN will basically aggregate information from the two hop neighbors. And then, <clears throat> so we look at, we update the representation of the one hop neighbors. And then the updated representation is actually used to compute the two hop representation of this vertex. Right? So two popular uh, approaches uh, used in NLP are GCN and GAT. So we saw this GCN equation before and we have this graph attention which is essentially weighted combination of the neighbors. So and these weights are given by softmax attention. So this part of applications is organized in four different subsections. So in the first subsection, we will see semantic role labeling, machine translation. In the second subsection, we will see text classification, extraction. So in the third one, we will see GNNs for knowledge graphs. And finally, we will briefly see GNNs for vision and NLP. Okay, okay so first we will see uh, semantic role labeling. So this was proposed in EMNLP 2017. So to understand the problem of SRL with a simple sentence, so let's say this is the input sentence, Sequa makes and repairs jet engines. So the problem of SRL is basically to discover predicates in the sentence, so which in this sentence is makes and repairs, and then to identify arguments of these predicates, so which in this sentence is Sequa and engines, right? Now, once we have identified the arguments, so we then identify the role, semantic roles of these arguments. So in this example, so we have the predicate makes and we have the word sequa and the role of makes uh, and the role of sequa is actually creator. And the role of engines is actually the creation of uh, the predicate makes. So it's an important problem because it is part of standard pipeline for question answering, information extraction, etc. Now, in this EMNLP 2017 paper, so they actually use dependency parsing for the problem of semantic role labeling. So we have the corresponding dependency graph here, so which gives us the dependency parse. So we have subject, conjunction, noun modified relationships. So one important observation here is that syntax mirrors semantics, right? So in this EMNLP 17 paper, so they actually use a graph neural net on the syntactic dependency graph. So for the problem of semantic role labeling, right? So the update equation, the graph convolution equation, so we'll look at each word in the sentence and then it will give us a hidden layer representation of that word. So what it will essentially do is that it will uh, look at the one hop neighborhood of each word in the sentence in the syntactic graph. So, and then it will, uh, it, it has a weight, it has a direction specific weight here, W, D, U, V. So it will look at the one hop neighborhood. It will aggregate features from the one hop neighborhood. So we have H U's here. And then there's a bias term. Uh, so for each label and direction. And then we also have edge wise gating. So some of the, some of the edges in the syntactic graph can be noisy, right? So this is actually controlled by edgewise gating. So which is a simple gating mechanism, which is added to the graph convolution, right? 
So let's understand how syntactic graph convolution is used for an input sentence. So we have a simple input sentence, Lane disputed those estimates. So we get the syntactic dependency graph using, let's say, Stanford NLP dependency parsing. So to compute the graph convolution of, let's say, the word Lane, so we look at its own representation. And then we look at the one hop neighbor of lane. So in this case, disputed, right? So, and then we aggregate features from the one hop neighborhood. So, and then we, we repeat this process for all the words in the sentence, for all disputed those estimates. Now this is, so this is the first hidden layer. So this is, what's, this is what happens in the first hidden layer. So in the second hidden layer, we take the representations of the first hidden layer and then we use these representations to aggregate features uh, from the syntactic dependency graph. So now we get the uh, two-layer representation. So let's see how this is used for SRL. So we have the input sentence, Lane disputed those estimates. So we get initial word embeddings for these sentences. And then these word embeddings are passed to a BIOSTM layer which gives us contextual representations. And then these embeddings are further refined by a GCN layer, which is run on the syntactic dependency graph, right? Now the output of these GCN representations, output of this GCN layer, so they are actually used for semantic role labeling, which is essentially a simple classifier. And this is trained with cross entropy loss, right? Now one interesting observation here is that because of this syntactic dependency graph, so arguments which are far away, so, so the words which are far away from each other will actually come closer because of the syntactic dependencies, right? So we have a simple experiment on the CoNLL 2009 data set for semantic role labeling. So we have a simple BIOSTM baseline, so which doesn't have this GCN layer. So and then we have BIOSTM plus GCN. So as we can see, there are like slight improvements for the task of semantic role labeling, right? And the main takeaway of this experiment is that GCN can integrate both syntax and context, right? And then GCN and LSTM complement each other because LSTM gives us contextual representation while GCN uh, further enriches it with uh, syntactic representations. So, so GCN has also been applied for machine translation. So this has also been proposed in EMLP 2017. So we have a simple example here. John sold the car to Mark. So this is in uh, English language. So this is passed to an artificial neural network, so which actually does neural machine translation. So this is English to German translation, right? So in this EMNLP 2017 paper, so they actually exploit syntactic dependencies between the words in the sentence. So they also exploit semantic dependencies, uh, which are obtained from the SRL model, right? So as we can see in these experiments, so we have a bag of words baseline, so we have bag of words plus syntactic GCN. We have a bi-gated recurrent uh, unit baseline. And then we have bi-group plus syntactic GCN, bi-group plus semantic GCN, bi-group plus both, semantic uh, plus syntactic GCN. So as we can see, we can uh, achieve slight improvements uh, over like bi-group based baselines. And the, and the best method turns out is by group plus syntactic GCN, which gives 16.1, right? And then again, the main takeaway here is that by group and GCN complement each other uh, in terms of representations for machine translation. Now in this ACL 18 paper, so they address some of the limitations of GCN. So it has like three limitations. One limitation is that the parameters uh, increase quadratically with number of edge labels. And there is no parameter sharing across hidden layers. And also edge labels are not encoded in the syntactic graph. So these limitations so are actually overcome by a GRU kind of architecture on the graph. So And this gives us best of both by GRU and GCN worlds. And one main advantage is that it has arbitrary number of layers without increasing parameters, right? 
So to be able to use a gated recurrent unit on a graph, so we need a simple pre-processing step, which is the Levy graph transformation, right? So to illustrate it, let's take this simple example. So there is a deeper issue at stake. So let's say this is the syntactic dependency graph. So the corresponding Levy graph uh, will, ha will actually have all the words of the input sentence. It's essentially a bipartite graph where on one side of the partition we have all the words of the input sentence and on the other side of the partition we have all the syntactic edge labels. right? And then we also add uh, sequential edges, so connecting every word uh, with its succeeding word. right? So this is the Levy graph. So there is an edge for every node comma edge pair. And then the main advantage of the Levy graph transformation is that edge labels can have uh, hidden layer representations. Now we can define a gated recurrent unit uh, on the Levy graph. So it is very similar to the standard GRU equations that we have here. So we have the reset gate operations, update gate operations. So the graph, the, so the graph version of it will essentially have some neighborhood feature aggregation. So in the reset uh, gate operations, update gate operations, and hidden layer computation, etc. So as we can see, uh, so bag of words plus so the Levy graph grew method so significantly improves uh, the previous methods that we discussed, right? And the main advantage uh, is because of uh, is because the edge labels also have some embeddings, hidden layer embeddings. So to summarize this section uh, of uh, GNNs for SRL and NMT, so the main takeaways are that syntax and semantics so are actually helpful for NLP, especially neural machine translation. And then the Levy graph transformation uh, enables edge label representations, so which can improve uh, neural machine translation. And then a couple of future direction could be to exploit uh, so the output of semantic role labeling for other tasks, not uh, essentially NMT for other NLP tasks. And one limitation of the Levy graph transformation is that edge labels and uh, uh, words of the sentence, so they share the same space in the Levy graph. So this is not uh, exactly ideal. So one solution could be to use decoupling as proposed in this paper. So are there any questions uh, for this section? Okay, so we can move on. Okay, so this completes the section on semantic role labeling and machine translation. So now we will see text classification and extraction applications. Uh, so using GNNs, right? So one line of work looks at event detection and time stamping documents. So EMNLP 18, ACL 18, AAAI 18. So a large body of work, so is relation extraction where there are like a lot of papers. So a lot of papers in ACL 19, so three papers in NACL 19, two in EMNLP 18. So in EMNLP 19, so we have three papers on sentiment analysis. So, and we also have word representations and text classification in EMNLP 19, ACL 19, okay. So let's briefly discuss some of the methods here. So let's look at the problem of event detection. So let's understand this with a simple example sentence. So we have the example here. So the police officer who fired into a car full of teenagers was fired yesterday, right? So the problem of event detection is to identify event triggers in this sentence. So in this example, so the two fired words are actually the event triggers. Now once we identified uh, these event triggers, we then classify these event triggers so into their types, right? So this word uh, conveys the meaning of attack, whereas this uh, word fired conveys the meaning of end position, right? So, and in this AAAI 18 paper, so they actually propose syntactic GCN uh, for the problem of event detection. And as we can see, so it outperforms a simple BIOSTM baseline. So, and the main reason why it outperforms is we can actually look at this example. So, we have the word fired here. So, the fired conveys the meaning of end position. And 
<coughs> in the syntactic dependency, so this word fired will actually be connected to the word police officer, right? So by LSTM actually fails to capture such uh, dependencies, whereas syntactic GCN can actually exploit a syntactic dependency between police officer and fired, and uh, so uh, so it will actually give the right output, so the end position output. Now, in this EMNLP 18 paper, so they looked at the problem of multiple events extraction. So, to illustrate this problem, let's look at an example. So, let's look at this example. He left the company. So, just by looking at this sentence, so, uh, so the word left might convey the meaning of end position. But if we add additional context, right, he left the company and planned to go home directly, so the word left is uh, actually conveys the meaning of transport, not end position, right? So as we can see, there can be some association between different events, uh, so in an input sentence. So in this example, so there is some association between this word left and this word go, right? So, so their motivation was that co-occurring event triggers, uh, so reduce ambiguity for the problem of event extraction. So, and they also uh, say that this is common in real world. For example, injure and die co-occur often. And they also say that 26% of events in the ACE 2005 data are actually co-occurring events, right? So, so to address this problem of multiple events extraction, so they actually propose, so this model, JMWE, Joint Multiple Event Extraction. So let's see the details of the model. So we have the input sentence here. So police have arrested four people in connection with the killings. So we get the syntactic dependency graph uh, between the words in this input sentence. And then we have a word embedding layer, so which computes word embeddings for each of the words in the sentence. And then we have a by LSTM layer, which gives us contextual representations. And then we have the graph convolutional layer, which will exploit the syntactic dependencies between the words in the sentence. And then we have a self-attention layer, which will actually exploit uh, correlation between events, right? So exploits association between triggers. And once we have these self-attention layers, we can use these representations for downstream applications. So for example, trigger classification and argument rule labeling. So, and since this is a joint model, we have like two loss functions here. So this entire model is trained on these two loss functions. So one loss function for the argument rule labeling task. So, and the other loss function is for the trigger classification task, right? So as we can see, the most competitive baseline is actually this AAAI 18 paper, so which is a dependency bridge-based recurrent neural network. So there, uh, so there are some slight improvements on trigger classification and argument rule labeling. So, and the main improvements uh, are because of the syntactic dependency graph. So this is an attention matrix, so which shows the attention values between every uh, word pace in the sentence. So as we can see, the attention value of killings and uh, uh, the word arrested, um, so the attention score uh, for this pair has a high value, right? So a related problem is document timestamping. So where we have an input sentence and we want to timestamp the document. So here we have shown uh, some three sentences. So again, we can exploit syntactic dependencies between words in the sentence. So, and the main structure in this sentence is the temporal structure, right? So for example, we have four years after, right? And then the word approved. So there is a before relationship between these two phrases. And then we have Swiss adopted uh, in 1995. So we have the same relationship. So this is the temporal dependency between the word adopted and the year 1995. So, and these temporal dependencies can be obtained using Katana, so which was proposed in this Colling 16 paper. Now, this temporal structure and the syntactic structure, so can be exploited to predict the document creation time of the document, right? So, let's see the model details. So, this was proposed in ACL 18. So, we have the input sentence. So, we have context embedding, which is given by the BILSTM uh, uh, 
architecture. And then we have syntactic embedding, which is given by the syntactic GCN, uh, which exploits the syntactic dependencies between the words. And then we have the temporal embedding, which exploits the temporal dependency, the temporal structure in the document, like after, before, same, after, same kind of dependencies. <coughs> And then we have a concatenated embedding. So this is the syntactic embedding and this is the temporal embedding. So we concatenate the two embeddings and then we use the concatenated embedding to a classifier. And this classifier will predict the document uh, creation time. So as we can see, over a simple BIOSTM baseline, so the temporal GCN achieves slight improvements and both syntactic GCN and temporal GCN um, further improves performance on this association press world stream data set. Right? And in this EMNLP 18 paper, so they propose graph attention for time stamping and the performance can be further improved using attention. And we have the attention scores here uh, in the form of a matrix. So as we can see for the document creation time and the word 1995, the attention score is very high. So another, another interesting problem is relation extraction. So where we want to identify relationship between entities. So a simple example, so Google was founded in California in 1998. So this sentence has like two relations, right? Founding year relationship between Google and 1998 and a founding location relationship between Google and California, right? So this is an important problem because it can be used for knowledge-based population, biomedical discovery, uh, question answering, etc. So a simple GNN-based model for relation extraction will have some steps. So one of those steps is the named entity recognizer, so which will actually give us the named entities in the input sentence. So as shown, so Google was founded in California, so the named entities are Google and California. Now it also has a graph construction phase. So where each word in the sentence becomes a node of the graph. And we'll see how the edges are constructed. Right? Now the output of the named entity recognizer and the graph that is obtained in the graph construction phase so are actually fed to the graph neural net which will output the relationship between the named entities in the input sentence. Right? So a, a simple example is Matt Coffin is an executive of uh, Lower My Bills. So we have Matt Coffin and Lower My Bills as the named entities. So we have some graph, the details of which we will see. So these two are actually passed to the GNN. So the GNN will output the relationship between the named entities. Right? Now one way we can improve this simple model is to use some additional side information. So we could use entity type uh, side information. So Matt Coffin uh, is a person, Lower My Bills is an organization. And we can also use relation alias side information. So we have Matt Coffin is the head of Lower My Bills, right? And, the, and then this side information is actually passed to the GNN. So in this EMNLP 18 paper, so they call the model as reside. So relation extraction using side information. So as we can see in this table, so on the readal data set, so even limited side information uh, outperforms like state-of-the-art baselines. Now one limitation of this simple GNN model is that it assumes uh, so the presence of a named entity recognizer, right? So this becomes a pipeline. So errors, so errors in this step, in this NER model, uh, will be propagated without any feedback to the graph neural net. So to address this limitation, so in this ACL 19 paper, so they actually propose joint entity and relation extraction. So where we have the input sentence, so for example, Trump governs USA, and then it is directly used without the named entity recognizer to the graph neural net. So the graph neural net will actually extract the triple or Trump governance USA. And the main advantage is that we can deduce other triples, like Trump governs USA, implies Trump is the president of USA, right? And there could be indirect inference. So for example, if the extracted relationship uh, are like White House Presidential Palace USA and Trump live in White House, so we can indirectly infer that Trump is the president of USA. So this is an important uh, problem for knowledge-based construction. 
So, and the main idea here, so they call the model as graph rel. So, the main idea is GCN on relational graphs. So, where we have a graph for each relation. So, this is like non relation, from relation, alias relation, and so on. So, we actually use GCN for all these relation dependent graphs, right? And since this is a joint model, we train with both entity and relation losses. So, as we can see in the table, so it outperforms the previous state of the art, which is multi decoder on the New York Times data set. So, a simple case study so, we have like Assam Peras is from the Sumatra and Malay Peninsula regions of Malaysia. So, as we can see, these are the extracted triplets. So, the main takeaway here is that this join model is able to figure out that this, this Assam Pade is actually an alias of. Uh, Assam Pedas, right? So it, it also extracts triples uh, like Assam Pade, region, Malay Peninsula. That's the main takeaway. So another related problem is joint type inference. So where we have input sentence, uh, so this was proposed in ACL 2019. So we have like Tufting was convicted with teammates in the capital and the goal is to like uh, predict the type of uh, each entity uh, in the sentence and also the type of the relationship uh, between entity pairs, right? And the main idea here is to use a graph convolutional network on a bipartite graph. So where on one side of the partition we have all the entities and on the other side of the partition we have all the relationships, right? Now this becomes a node classification problem on this bipartite graph. So as we can see, uh, so GCN for joint type inference, so outperforms the previous state of the art. So on the ACE 2005 data set, right? <coughs> now another way this simple GNN model can be improved is in the graph construction phase. So this is especially relevant for document level relation extraction, inter-sentence relation extraction. So for example, oxytocin is a commonly used uterotonic. So oxt can cause significant hypotension. So let's say we want the relationship between oxytocin and hypotension. So the word oxytocin and the word hypotension, they're actually present in two different sentences, right? So this is document level relation extraction. So in this ACL 19 paper, so they actually propose co-reference edges uh, between different words like oxytocin and oxt, right? And then they show that these co-reference edges can improve uh, inter-sentence relation extraction over a simple bile STM baseline. Now, as a follow-up work, so in this EMNLP 19 paper, so they propose an edge-oriented graph neural net. So, and the main idea here is that if we look at this snippet, so we have this uh, entity, ethambutol, and we have this entity, disease entity, scotoma. So there is a document level relationship between this entity and this entity. So, but to figure out that there is a document level relationship between these two entities, so we need additional information. So we need information uh, of, of a relationship between this entity, ethambutol, and this entity, bilateral optic neuropathy. And we need to figure out that this entity is the same as this entity, bilateral uh, retro uh, bulbar uh, neuropathy. And then we have to figure out that there is a relationship between this entity and the disease scotoma. So, so, so as we can see, so this document level relationship can only be inferred from a chain of intra-sentence relations, right? So for this reason, they actually propose an edge-oriented graph neural net. And then, they, and then they construct a heterogeneous graph. So where we have different types of nodes. So we have like uh, mention nodes, sentence nodes, and uh, entity nodes uh, in the heterogeneous graph. So we take the average of uh, word representations, so as initial node representations. <coughs> And then to get the edge representations, so we have some concatenation operation. And once we have these edge representations, we can use them uh, for the edge-oriented graph neural net. So ba the basic idea here is that for two incidence edges, so we concatenate. So we project uh, one of the edges to the same space, and then we concatenate uh, the embeddings. Right? 
and then to compute the edge representation, we take uh, the previous edge representation and then we take the convex combination of uh, the previous one and this f, right? And then this edge representation is used for downstream relation extraction task. So on the CDR data set, so this, uh, they show improvements over uh, a character level CNN and then a graph kernel based approach. And then they do some ablation on GDA data set. And the main takeaway here is that heterogeneity models uh, relationships between uh, intra and inter relations, right? <clears throat> And one disadvantage um, is that it requires predefined graphs, right? So it cannot be directly applied on text. So can we do graph induction, right? So in this ACL 19 paper, so they actually propose graph induction for the task of relational reasoning, right? For example, if we have Leon is an English language film directed by Luke, so we have Leon uh, language English as one relation, Leon cast member uh, look Besson as another relationship, and we can also do some reasoning like look Besson language spoken English. So this is the reasoning part. So the main idea here is we encode each word uh, with respect to the given entity pair. And then to induce the graph, so to basically construct the adjacency matrix, so AIJ, so we have a multilayer perceptron on the bi LSTM uh, representations, right? So they show, so they, uh, so they call their model uh, generated parameters graph neural net. So they show improvements over state of the art uh, baseline. So as a case study, so if we look at state of the art baselines, so there's a simple sentence, Uzam is a Malayalam film uh, written by Jitu uh, with Prithviraj. So if we look at the state of the art baselines, so they give some relationships, but their model, GPGNN, uh, so is able to do some reasoning, right? So Prithviraj uh, language spoken Malayalam, so which was not done by the previous state of the art baselines, right? So another way we can improve this simple GNN based model um, is to basically purify the graph. So the graph may be noisy for downstream tasks. So it may include some unwanted edges. So we have a graph pruning step. So where we prune out some of the edges and then the pruned graph is passed to the GNN for the relation extraction task. So this has been done in the biomedical domain. So suppose we want the relationship uh, so this is, an, this is a three-array relationship, so between some named entities in the biomedical domain. So previous works uh, propose rule-based approaches like shortest path LCA subtree. So LCA stands for lowest common ancestor. So EMNLP 15, ACL 16, EMNLP 18. So they propose rule-based approaches. But in this ACL 19 paper, so they actually propose to learn uh, uh, the graph pruning stage, right? And the key step here is they have an attention-based uh, step, so which will actually learn the graph uh, pruning, right? And then as we can see in this table, the previous state of the art, so this is EMNLP 18 paper, which actually uses a rule-based mechanism. So they show that learning to prune, so AGGCN is attention-guided GCN, so they show that learning to prune uh, outperforms rule-based pruning. Right? So another interesting task is uh, general word representation learning. So where we have an input sentence and we want to compute useful word representations. Right? So in this ACL 19 paper, so they actually propose uh, to compute word representations on the syntactic dependency graph. And then it's very similar to what we have discussed. So we have the syntactic dependencies between the words and we have a GCN layer which will exploit the syntactic dependencies. And then these representations um, so are actually used for some downstream tasks. So in this case, it is word similarity. So as we can see, syn GCN outperforms some baselines, right? So they also propose semantic GCN which will exploit uh, document level semantics so in pre-trained word embeddings like synonym, hyponym, etc. So we have like H2O is a synonym of water and ocean is a hyponym of water. So such relationships can be exploited using GCN. 
and then again for word similarity tasks so they show it outperforms like uh, previous state of the art baselines and then in this EMNLP 19 paper so graph convolution have been used for short text classification so it's a simple example so Sean it home two runs as LA defeated Atlanta right so this short text is of uh, class ports right so this is very useful for news tagging, sentiment analysis, query intent classification, etc. So the main challenges for the problem of STC so are that uh, the label data are very scarce, so expensive human labeling is required, and it is semantically sparse and they lack context. So to address these two limitations, so this EMNLP 19 paper so actually uses a semi-supervised uh, technique on the heterogeneous graph, which we will see. So we have all the short texts here. So for example, the seed of Apple's innovation in an era when most technology, uh, so on. So, so all these short texts form the nodes of the heterogeneous graph. And then we have all the topics of these short texts as also the nodes. And then we have all the entities present in these short texts as the third type of nodes. So this is the schema of the heterogeneous graph. We have like topic nodes, short text nodes, and then entity nodes, right? So to get the topics, we use uh, latent directional uh, allocation, LDA. And then to get entities, we use uh, an entity linking system, tag me entity linking system. And then to uh, get the entity edges, right? So we use simple word to x similarity. And then to use uh, initial features for GCN. So for the topic nodes, we use word distribution. For these short text nodes, we use TF IDF representation. And for these entity nodes, we use TF IDF of the wiki description. Right? Now the problem is given some of the labeled short text to label the unlabeled ones. Right? So for example, we have a labeled short text here, which is of type business. So we want to label the unlabeled short texts, right? So they propose heterogeneous graph convolution, so which will essentially look at each type, each node type, and then it will aggregate information from all node types, right? And then they have a type level attention mechanism where we compute uh, type embedding, and then we have attention scores over this uh, type embedding. And then they also have node level attention, so which is very similar to graph attention. And then these representations, so are actually trained with the cross entropy loss uh, on the label short texts, right? So as we can see in the table, so this also shows some ablation study. So, so the proposed model is heterogeneous graph attention network. So as we can see, all the components um, in the proposed model are actually useful for uh, short text classification. So this is heterogeneous graph attention without attributes, uh, HCAT uh, without type attention and so on. Right? So they also have a case study where they show, so these attention values have actually some meaning. So to summarize this section of uh, GNNs for text, so the main takeaways, so research has been looking at join models. So for example, multiple events extraction, joint event and relation extraction and so on. So research has focused on graph construction, graph induction, graph pruning for relation extraction. And then corpus level graphs, uh, uh, for example, temporal structure, semantic structure, like inter-sentence relation extraction, they help. And then a couple of future directions. So, so it will be interesting to see edge pruning for graph level tasks. So this was only at the node level. And to the best of our knowledge, uh, uh, we have not encountered GNNs for zero shot relation extraction. So there has been a work on long tail relation extraction, uh, but no work on uh, zero shot relation extraction using graph neural nets. So are there any questions in this section? Uh, have you compared uh, the relation extraction techniques using graph uh, uh, GNNs against the standard IE techniques like OpenIE systems? OpenIE systems, yes. So we have actually not included those baselines uh, here.
For example, this reside model actually compares with an open IE technique, but we have not included those baselines in this table. So I think we can see the paper to uh, look at the baseline. So we have uh, we've only shown the uh, most competitive baselines here. There <coughs> other questions? I have a question. Uh, since we know the relation, uh, the graph construction is not perfect, and there are so many different ways to construct a graph. So, uh, is it possible that uh, if we construct it randomly, can also bring some improvement, or is there any comparison between like a random graph or uh, relation graph or parsing graph? Uh, thank you. So for the random graph, we randomly connect some nodes, right? So, so it has been shown in uh, many papers that the graph that we have actually outperforms a random graph where we connect nodes randomly. Any other questions? Okay, so the third uh, part in this section is GNN, so knowledge graphs. So we will see what works exist. So the first line of works looks at KG embedding, so where we want to embed entities in the knowledge graphs, so ACL19, AAA19, and so on. So in the computer vision domain, so we have label correlation. So the knowledge graph is of, uh, so the knowledge graph has labels as entities and we want to exploit label correlation, uh, for example, uh, multi-label image classification. Right? And then we have text generation using knowledge graphs, right? So it could be conversation generation, it could be like text generation from abstracts, it could be visual question answering, it could be question answering and so on. And then in the data community, we have recommender systems, right? So where we want to recommend items to users. And finally, we have knowledge graph entity alignment. So where we have two different knowledge graphs and we want to align uh, all the entities in the knowledge graph, right? Now let's look at the knowledge graph embedding. So here we have shown a small snippet of a knowledge graph. So so current knowledge graph embedding techniques using graph neural nets can actually be written in this form. So where we have hidden representation of each entity. So we look at all the relations in the knowledge graph. We take summation over relations. And then for each relation, we look at the neighborhood of the entity. So all objects in the neighborhood of those entities. So and then we have some function which will take uh, the subject relation object and also the layer number L as input, right? Now, if the context is clear, so, so we have actually deleted layer here, assuming the context is clear. Now, uh, so there are like four different knowledge graph embeddings. So the first uh, proposed knowledge graph embedding technique is relational GCN, RGCN. So, and it has this uh, F form, right? So we have a relation specific parameter matrix, and then we have the hidden representation of the object node, right? And then in this AAA 19 paper, so this is structure aware convolutional network. So this has like a relation specific scalar weight, and then a parameter matrix W multiplied to the hidden layer embedding of the object uh, entity. And then in this Ichikai 19 paper, we have, sorry. So in this Ichikai 19 paper, we have vectorized relational GCN. So where we have a parameter matrix W, and then we have some function phi, which takes hidden representation of relation and hidden representation of object as inputs, right? So for example, a popular uh, function, uh, a popular function for phi could be like the transi function. 
So where we take the difference between uh, HR and HO, right? And in this ACL 19 paper, so so they actually propose triple embedding. So where we have so alpha SRO, it's like softmax attention of uh, the triple, and then we have the W matrix, and then we have the triple embedding. So the hidden layer representation of the triple SRO. Right. So just to see where they stand uh, uh, with respect to the state of the art. So the current state of the art on the WordNet 18 data set is actually rotation edge. So this is hyperbolic rotation. So this will. Uh, so this is going to appear in Nudibs 19. So just to see how it uh, uh, compares with the current state of the art. So 0.49 is the current state of the art, and the closest one is the vectorized relational GCN, which actually is 0.48. So all these methods are actually transductive in nature. So one main assumption they make is that all these entities are actually present during training, right? So to address this limitation, so, so in this AAA19 paper, so they look at the problem of inductive KG embedding. So where, so they motivate it uh, with the help of a news article, so where we can have a new entity which is not present in the knowledge graph, right? So there could be a new entity, emerging entity, with some relationships to existing entities. And uh, so we cannot retrain the previous methods, so which is a very costly operation. So some properties so uh, that such an inductive embedding method should have. So the first property is redundancy aware. So for example, so we have play for Chicago Bulls. So implies works as basketball player, right? So it should be redundant, uh, redundancy aware, right? And then it could, it could be query relation aware. So we could exploit, uh, for example, live in at test time. So we have this new entity. So we have this live-in relationship, which is known at test time. So this is called the query relationship, live-in. So we can exploit that uh, query relation. And it also has to be permutation invariant. So, so the way we aggregate information um, while doing the GCN operation should not depend on the order in which we consider the neighbors. right? So in this AAAI 19 paper for inductive KG embedding, so they propose LAN, logic attention network. So this is the uh, graph uh, aggregation procedure, right? So we have embedding of each entity. So we have some attention values, which we will see soon. So, and then we have some transformation, relation specific transformation function applied on the object entity, right? And now these attention scores so come uh, from the logic-based uh, uh, mechanism and a neural network-based mechanism. So the logic-based mechanism uh, will actually use some co-occurrence statistic to compute the attention score. And the neural network-based attention mechanism will use uh, simple softmax attention. Right? So they show that uh, so this logic attention network outperforms uh, LSTM uh, aggregation and mean aggregation for the task of inductive KG embedding. So both on WordNet 11 and uh, Freebase 15K. So they also do some ablation studies where they show all the components are actually important uh, for inductive KG embedding. So a related problem is open KG embedding. So let's say we have these two sentences in the corpus, like Barack Obama, 44th president of USA, took birth in Honolulu, and Michelle Obama, wife of Barack, was born in Chicago, right? So let's say we run an open IE uh, extraction system on these sentences. So now we end up with this graph, right? So Barack Obama, 44th president of USA, and Barack, wife of Michelle Obama. So the main problem here, is that the model has, uh, uh, I mean, uh, so, so we have no way of uh, knowing beforehand that Barack Obama and Barack actually refer to the same entity. So this is known as the knowledge-based canonicalization problem. So where we want to canonicalize, so entities uh, uh, which have like different surface forms, right? So as an example, Barack Obama and Barack, right? So in this EMNLP 19 paper, so they actually propose canonicalized infused representation. 
so uh, for the problem of open kg embedding so here the main idea is you look at the input triple so we have word embeddings for all the uh, words in the relation phrase so we have the phrase encoder network and then for e uh, for each subject and object so we have canonical cluster encoder network right so this is where the gcn uh, uh, so this is where gcn is used right so we have different surface forms representing the same entity so we use gcn on this graph to get uh, hidden layer representations right and then this is used for triple scoring and uh, with a triple loss function so the main part where the gcn is used in, is in this canonical cluster network for the subject entity and for the object entity so and they show in this emnlp 19 paper so so that it outperforms significantly uh, over a simple convy baseline on this uh, reverb 45k dataset so a closely related problem to open kg embedding is knowledge graph alignment right so where we have like two different knowledge graphs with potentially two different surface forms so the problem is to align the entities in these knowledge graphs right so we could have different knowledge graphs uh, such as freebase nl yago which provide prior information for nlp tasks so these are constructed separately so they have distinct surface forms and they are often supplementary in contents and also the wikipedia knowledge graph is multilingual so we have we can have the english version and the chinese version so the problem is to align the entities in the knowledge graphs right so the main motivation is to provide a unified uh, knowledge graph representation now what prior work has done to this problem is that uh, so in this VLDB 12 paper so they have looked at a symbolic based method for this entity alignment problem and very recently MNLP 18 each guy 17 uh, so research has shifted to embedding based methods but the main assumption of these embedding based methods is that the counterparts have similar structures but in this ACL 19 paper so they actually uh, <coughs> So they actually point out some limitations of prior works. So the symbolic based method is ineffective for distinct surface forms. And these embedding based methods so are actually ineffective when there is structural heterogeneity uh, in the two knowledge graphs. So for example, we have the English knowledge graph and the Chinese knowledge graph. So we have uh, Jilin city, which is a Chinese city. So it is very likely that uh, a Chinese city will have some additional relationships like mayor relationship in the Chinese version of the knowledge graph but not the English version right so there is some structural heterogeneity so in these two knowledge graphs so to address this structural heterogeneity so they actually propose a robust graph neural net so they call it robust uh, multi-channel graph neural net to address this structural heterogeneity problem and the main two steps in this robust architecture is missing relation prediction. So for example, Jilin City dialect uh, so is actually present in this knowledge graph, but it is not present in the English version, right? So we do relation prediction on this English version. And then we can do exclusive entity pruning, right? So for example, there is an entity, Liu Fei, which is present in the Chinese version, but not in the English version. So this is exclusive entity pruning. So they actually propose joint KG inference and alignment using this MUGNN method. So we have the two input knowledge graphs. So let's see the architecture details. So the problem is to maximize cardinality of AE. So where AE is the set of all aligned entities in the knowledge graph. And we are also given some seed alignments, maybe seed entity alignments and seed relation alignments. Right? So the first step um, in the MUGNN method is rule inference and transfer. So using AME plus proposed in this VLDB 15 paper, so they, are, so they are able to infer some rules in the knowledge graph. For example, born in X comma Y and city of Y comma Z implies nationality of X comma Z, right? So with this rule inference and transfer, so they actually propose KG completion. So on both the knowledge graphs. 
and then they have a relation weighting mechanism so which will actually uh, uh, which which is useful for exclusive entity pruning and they have a multi channel graph neural net they have a two channel graph neural net where they have a self attention operation this so this is very similar to graph attention and they also have cross kg attention so where we look at one knowledge graph and uh, depending on the other knowledge graph so we have some attention mechanism right so based on the similarity of the relation embeddings so we have an attention mechanism this so this is called cross kg attention so this is responsible for pruning exclusive entities so now they propose multi channel graph neural net so which is essentially pooling of uh, so the different representations which we obtain from different layers right different channels so we have like self attention channel and the cross kg attention channel right so now we can align the uh, align the entities in the two knowledge graphs using like a joint loss function so alignment loss function uh, and the relation prediction loss function right so and as we can see in the table so for the task of dbpedia to yago uh, entity alignment so they actually achieve uh, state of the art performance and the main takeaway here is that joint uh, inference and alignment uh, significantly helps uh, entity alignment right? so one prob one interesting problem other interesting problem is question answering from kg plus text right so let's say we have a question like who voiced meg in family guy so so in this emnlp 18 paper so they actually so look at the knowledge graph and also the textual descriptions of the entities present in the question right so we have meg griffin family guy as the entities in the knowledge graph and we also have some additional text description right so for example meg griffin is a character from the animated uh, series family guy so this is the question subgraph uh, from the knowledge graph so they actually so this is a heterogeneous graph so where we have entity nodes and we also have uh, uh, text nodes right so we have two different types of nodes so in this emnlp 18 paper so they actually propose heterogeneous updates so where we update uh, different types differently so specifically for for the entity nodes we look at four different representations so the previous representation the question representation and we have a relation specific function and then we look at the textual description right four different representations but for the textual nodes so we look at only uh, the entity nodes the, the the neighboring entity nodes right so so then these representations are used to basically answer the question so for example who voiced megan family guy so the answers are lacy chabot and mila kunis right so as we can see in the table so the a uh, problem of question answering from kg plus text so they outperform uh, a key value memory net baseline so they also show kg only and text only methods so they are actually competitive with the uh, uh, minerva method and r2 asv methods right so another interesting problem is text generation from knowledge graphs right so we have a small knowledge graph here so which describes uh, a scientific article so from this knowledge graph as input so we want to predict the abstract of the scientific article so this is the output of the model right so yeah so we have the knowledge graph as input and also the title of the scientific article so for example event detection with conditional random fields so the title of the article as inputs so and the output has to be the abstract of the scientific article so here graph neural net has been useful on the kg side so they actually propose a graph transformer model so which is essentially combination of uh, so graph attention i clear 18 paper and self attention nurib 17 paper right so and in this nackel 19 paper so they use this graph transformer model so they call the model as graph writer so they show improvements uh, over a simple graph attention baseline for the problem of text generation right? 
So the main takeaways, uh, so to briefly summarize graph neural nets for knowledge graphs. So graph neural nets on top of existing models help and uh, open knowledge graphs and inductive approaches. So they are relatively less, uh, less explored and some future directions so we can have we can scale these GNNs for web scale knowledge graphs so one interesting technique could be important sampling so to sample neighbors and then we so the current state of the art for knowledge graph embedding is hyperbolic rotation so <coughs> So we also have hyperbolic graph neural nets. So maybe we can have the best of both worlds, hyperbolic graph neural nets and hyperbolic rotation to further improve KG embedding performance. Right? And also we can uh, analyze these models theoretically. Right? For example, stability, generalization error bounds. Right? So this concludes graph neural nets for knowledge graphs. Now we will briefly see graph neural nets for vision and NLP. So one line uh, of... Nagaran, do you want to stop for questions? Yeah, yeah. So are there any questions here? Okay, so we will briefly see graph neural nets for vision and NLP. So one line of work looks at visual question answering. So CVPR 19, NeurIPS 18. And then as we discussed for knowledge graphs, we have label correlation. So, which is popular in the vision community. And then very recently in ICCV19, we have language grounding. And then expression comprehension. And then uh, uh, research has also used uh, image captioning, graph neural nets for image captioning. So, let's look at the problem of zero-shot learning. So, we have here zebra images and deer image, right? So, and we also have an additional unlabeled image. But we have some textual description like this. Okapi is a zebra stripped four legged animal with a brown torso and a deer like face. Right? So this is the problem of zero shot learning. So where we have um, instances of unseen labels at test time. So this is an Okapi image so which only appears at test time. So the model has to figure out that this is an Okapi image by looking at zebra and deer images and also some metadata like this textual description. Right? So GCN has been useful for this problem of zero shot learning. So we have AXW. So the adjacency matrix is essentially a label graph where the graph has labels as vertices. So which connects zebra, deer and okapi. And the X matrix is basically the textual descriptions, right? Some bag of words textual descriptions of uh, 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 the, the example that we saw. Now the GCN prediction is Z, so, uh, so the, the W matrix is learned during training. So, so what is interesting here is that this Z, the output of GCN, so they're actually used as weights for a convolutional neural network on this image, right? So that's the main idea. So this was proposed in CVPR 18. So as we can see, so it outperforms significantly uh, compared to the previous uh, state-of-the-art technique. So the main takeaway here is that GCN can integrate both vertex features, textual descriptions in this case, and the graph structure. So, so the NEL knowledge graph in this case. Right? So, so another interesting problem is visual question answering. So for example, if we have this image and we have this question, right? So what is the area used for? So, <clears throat> so just by looking at this image, so it is not possible to answer this question. So we need some additional knowledge. So for example, field is used for grazing, right? So by looking at this image, so the model can figure out that uh, uh, there is a field here, but to be but to answer this question, what is the area used for? So we need additional knowledge, like field used for grazing. So this is called factual visual question answering. So another example, so which looks more like tiger. So to be able to answer this question, so we need additional knowledge, like cat is related to tiger, using which we can answer this question. Right? So which looks more like tiger? So the answer is cat. 
So GCN has been used for this problem of factual visual question answering. So we have the input image. So let's say this is the question. So which object is a citric fruit in this input image? So the first step is fact retrieval. So where we retrieve all the relevant facts um, from the question and uh, also uh, CNN features. And then we have the answer prediction module. So where these uh, facts um, uh, have representations, have LSTM representations. And the question also has an LSTM question representation. Right? And then this image so is passed to a CNN, convolutional neural network, to get image representation. Right? So now all these three are concatenated. So the image representation, the question representation, and the related entity representations. Right? So they are concatenated. And then we have the knowledge graph. So apple is a fruit. So orange is a fruit. Orange is a citric fruit. So we have this knowledge graph. Now we use these representations as uh, features to this knowledge graph. And then we run a GCN on this knowledge graph. And uh, then we have a simple multi-layer perceptron, which is uh, used to do classification, basically uh, visual question answering. So in this case, the answer turns out to be orange. right? So as we can see, so in this New Lips 18 paper, so they show that so it outperforms the previous state of the art significantly. So the main takeaways for graph neural nets for vision and NLP. So 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 GNNs uh, exploit KG plus text for zero shot visual learning, and then GNNs can reason about answers in visual question answering. So one interesting future direction could be to look at multimodal knowledge graphs, right? So where each entity in the knowledge graph also has an image associated with it. Right? So multimodal knowledge graphs can be used for image to text mapping, image to KG entity mapping. So KG plus image plus text for KG embedding and so on. So we, uh, so we have not covered uh, other papers. So, so these are some of the other papers so which we have not covered for NLP. So question answering and reading comprehension. So EMNLP 19, ACL 19 papers. So there is some uh, 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 work around AMR to text generation, EMNLP 18, ACL 19, and so on. So and in EMNLP 19, we have sentiment analysis using graph neural nets and uh, many more applications, right? So now I request Shikhar to discuss open problems and conclusion. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'll be talking about some open problems and uh, then I'll conclude the tutorial. <coughs> Uh, so if you look at uh, this recent uh, ICLR 2020 submissions, uh, then uh, they are like uh, GNNs plus NLP has been uh, the most like most submitted topic. So like uh, compared to other topics like Transformer and GAN, uh, there has been like subsequent increase in the number of submissions uh, relate, uh, on the papers related to graph neural networks. Uh, and uh, especially GNNs with, with NLP. So uh, the tutorial is like uh, very relevant at this time, like uh, because this GNN plus NLP combination is uh, is on rise. <coughs> so uh, so we explored a uh, lot of uh, graph structures, like how can we uh, exploit them using graph convolution networks. But uh, there is no end to it. So uh, like GNNs have been applied at several other areas. So recently, like uh, GNNs are being used for abusive language detection and for social navigation and so on. So, uh, so the field is not yet explored and there is a lot of uh, like still uh, several graph structures which on where the GCNs can be applied and uh, we can get subsequent like uh, gains on that. Uh, so, uh, so the uh, one of the open problem is that like uh, most of the works uh, they just uh, concentrate themselves on using this uh, first order approximation which was proposed by KIF. Uh, but uh, like uh, there are more uh, uh, like uh, uh, higher order, uh, <coughs> like uh, more powerful uh, variants of GCNs, which are called like spectral GCNs. So instead of like uh, constraining ourselves to first order approximations, these spectral GCNs can also be exploited uh, on several other problems. 
Uh, yeah, so few more open problems on this. So uh, it has been observed that uh, one, like on using like uh, GCNs beyond like two or three layers, the performance starts uh, dropping uh, substantially. So uh, so like it's an, still an open problem. Like uh, why is it so? And like uh, why a lot like multiple layers is helping us to improve the performance? Why there is a dip in the performance after two or three layers? So it's still an open problem yet to be explored. Uh, then uh, <coughs> people have not uh, much explored. Uh, ap on applying uh, these GNNs for dynamic graphs. So by dynamic graphs, I mean that where the number of where the nodes are getting added or removed from the network with time. And so the on on these cases, the GNNs have not been explored much. And moreover, uh, most of the G uh, GNN formulations are not uh, directly applicable to large graphs. So still, a uh, lot of work needs to be done on scaling these. Uh, GNNs for large graphs like uh, on like uh, like on where the number of nodes are in like millions or something, so still uh, that area is unexplored, and uh, uh, and like uh, what is the best graph for the downstream task? As one of uh, one of the one person in the audience pointed out that which graph to use for a particular problem that's still an open problem. So that also needs to be explored. So, like uh, as we said, that GNNs are not uh, uh, like the field is not yet explored. There are still a lot of graph structure uh, where like uh, GNNs can be exploited for specifically for NLP. Uh, so yeah, uh, so graphs are everywhere, and uh, G GNNs are an like very effective tool for exploiting such graph structures. And the major advantage with that is that uh, they also they are also like end-to-end -end model, like they can be incorporated in the architecture in end-to-end -end fashion. So all the weights and parameter can be trained based on the final objective. And they are like uh, GNNs are versatile, and uh, we showed through our uh, tutorial that they can be applied in multiple settings, like semi-supervised setting, unsupervised setting, supervised setting, and uh, they can be applied at multiple granularity. Like uh, one can apply GNNs at node level. At uh, subgraph level, at whole graph, they can be used for link prediction as well. And uh, like GNNs have been proposed for all types of graph structures. So uh, starting with undirected graphs to directed graphs, and like they uh, recently like uh, GNNs for multi-relational graphs where the edge has uh, direction as well as label information. There also like GNNs uh, variants of GNNs have been proposed. Uh, and like uh, for uh, so e both in NLP as well as vision, like there has been several tasks on which uh, so like GNNs have given substantial improvement in the performance, and there are like many more possibilities ahead. So uh, we have made the slides and uh, code of uh, used in the tutorial available. So uh, you can go to this link. Uh, so there, like we have uploaded the sl slides as well. So so uh, apart from this tutorial, uh, there has been a series of tutorial on graph convolution networks. So one can refer to them as well. So starting with this NIPS 2017 tutorial uh, by Bronstein, and uh, like there has been a series of tutorial in CVPR, SGM, IPM, and www. So one can uh, refer to those tutorials as well, uh, apart from our work. So we'll be happy to take uh, questions on the whole tutorial. Like if someone has. So we have uh, quite a lot of time for questions, if you have any. No? Okay. So uh, just to uh, wrap up, so, <clears throat> um, so as you can see, like, you know, most of the, I mean, already uh, GNNs for NLP, uh, there are uh, lots of uh, applications that have been done and uh, like the you know, improvements in state of the art. But if you look at the time history, like you know, uh, most of the models that are being used are again that first order approximation, the KIF model, uh, that was just proposed in uh, 2017, in ICLEAR 2017. So just in these two years, there's been an explosion of work in this area with uh, good effect. But uh, as uh, we covered, a lot of the methods are still unexplored. And like, you know, in terms of while the methods are there, they've been proposed, but their applications in NLP are still to a large extent uh, like, you know, restricted to the first order approximations uh, that we talked about earlier. So I think it uh, pr presents a tremendous opportunity for the NLP community to take up and contribute towards those methods and also apply them on a variety of uh, NLP tasks. Uh, what's also interesting is that like, you know, graph uh, data structures 
is a very uh, generic uh, data structure which allows you to uh, encode uh, information at many different levels, uh, be it at the word level, sentence level, document level, corpus level, uh, using various types of uh, relationships, uh, not just similarity. Like, you know, you could pose arbitrary relationships among these different nodes that you want to create at those different granularities. And uh, these GNN uh, methods, uh, these GCN variants, uh, allows you to work at all of those different granularities and learn embeddings in a task-specific manner and feed it into your favorite uh, deep learning methods. Uh, what's uh, interesting is that like previously, if you want to encode these different types of relationships, you had to like, you know, build a separate model altogether. So if you remember early on, I talked about this uh, graph-based semi-supervised learning uh, where like, you know, the only type of relationship that was encoded between the nodes in the graph was the similarity. Right? So if you kind of like continue doing that line of work, like a completely separate model was proposed uh, where like, you know, in, in addition to similarity, you also want to capture like an you know, antonym relationship, right? Or subsequently some other methods where for each type of relationship, uh, you actually propose a completely different model to like, you know, in a relation specific way, you have to tune your model. So what's really nice about these GCNs and graph neural network methods is that you just dump in all of these different types of relationships that you have and you expect that the model will adjust and learn the right semantics and the representation for all of those. So the key difference here is that in those previous uh, non-deep, non-GNN based methods, uh, you had to encode the semantics of those relationships, but now uh, with the advent of these methods, uh, we can learn those relationship specific semantics and their utility for the task uh, just based on the training data, right? Uh, also, uh, the, these kind of like graph-based formulations are interesting because it allows you to capture information not just from your training data, but also you could uh, borrow in external information from say knowledge graphs and other structures that you may have uh, information at your disposal. That could be very useful uh, when you have limited amounts of training data, right? So like you know, deep learning has been very successful when you have tremendous amounts of training data, but for many, many tasks, we may not be fortunate to have that much amount of training data. So like you know, if you are able to uh, uh, borrow in some external information from knowledge structures or any other prior information that you may have, where graphs could provide a flexible mechanism to represent all of that information, uh, so now you could like, you know, incorporate that in your deep learning method. So that way you could now learn, start to adapt these deep learning methods uh, towards like, you know, less supervision settings, utilizing these external sources where it was originally presented in a form of a graph, but now you could like, you know, learn representations and you make them useful in a task-specific principled manner. So I think that way it opens up lots of interesting avenues for further exploration in NLP. Uh, hopefully this tutorial uh, help you in getting some uh, initial pointers uh, in this really exciting and emerging uh, area of research. Uh, our goal was here not to kind of like go in depth of all of these things, but provide you some sort of like you know, links uh, to uh, areas uh, that you can uh, further follow up on, right? And uh, hopefully this was useful for you. And again, uh, so on behalf of all three of us, uh, we thank you for your time. And if you have any more questions, we'll be happy to take them. Okay, so thanks again then.